Welcome to Rotary and Serving Our Community. My name is Wade Nomura, and with us today we have a special guest, uh, Rotary International Director Brad Howard and his wife, Marcia. Thank you for joining us, Brad, Marcia. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome. Um, hope the drive wasn't too hard coming down the hill there. No, it was beautiful. Five hours of driving through wine country. Well, well except for the first hour driving through traffic in the Bay Area. But other than that, <laughs> it was wonderful. No stops at the wine, near the wine country then, huh? Uh, not, not on the way down. We not this trip. <laughs> okay. If we get done with this early, we'll go up. <laughs> there you go. We'll try and get it done early then. Um, Brad, tell us a little bit about what a director is, a Rotary International Director. Well, Rotary's uh, role for a director is a little bit different than most corporations. I mean, there's an element to it where I am one of 19 people that sit on a, a board. It's a corporate board, and so it has corporate responsibilities, uh, fiduciary, operational, um, strategic, and, and long-term planning. Uh, also, resource allocation, all policies, and things that you would reasonably expect out of a nonprofit board. Rotary is a little different in the sense that we also represent a region, a part of the world, and we have an, somewhat of an operational role within that area to help the health of the clubs, to help the clubs be stronger and better so that they can do the work that Rotary is known for doing throughout the world. So you, have, you wear two different hats. At times, that gets a little bit confusing, but nonetheless, it does give you a chance to express regionally as well as corporately. Got it. Thank you. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with Rotary and where you come from professionally. I appreciate that. Um, well, professionally, uh, I started off in, in marketing and advertising. I worked at a Clorox company for a number of years as a brand manager, which sort of filtered my perception of, of the world through marketing lens. That's how Marsha and I got to know each other. Uh, she was working at an ad agency, and there's a whole other story behind that. <laughs> but, um, and after I got done with that, uh, towards the end of that experience, um, my father had started a business back in, in the 1940s running tours in Hawaii. I'm originally from Hawaii, my family's from Hawaii, and so he was bringing in tours from, um, from the mainland, and so we moved over here, and he expanded the business, and after working in corporate America for a while, it looked like a good opportunity to, to get closer to the family and also experience the business, so I started there. Um, my father was in Rotary, and I concluded quickly that it was going to be far easier to join Rotary than it was going to be to listen to my father week after week <laughs> tell me why I needed to be in the Rotary. So I joined in the, uh, in the mid-80s and just kind of followed a path. It's interesting, you know, there's a lot of type A people that are in Rotary because we're really focused on business professional and community leaders, so people that are, tend to be drivers. But what's interesting is the whole path in Rotary has been anything but a type A experience. There hasn't been a path. It's just been the next experience that leads you to the next one that leads you to the next one. And eventually, it seemed to make some sense to have an opportunity to serve at this level. And I uh, took that on starting July the 1st, and it'll go for two years and uh, June 30, 2017. Wow. Okay, great. Thank you. Marcia, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, as Brad said, uh, about 30 years ago, we got married and I got introduced to Rotary at that point. Um, Full-time working for the last 35 years um, in advertising and marketing. And the last two years, I've had a new job kind of in the remodeling <laughs> mode. <laughs> um, that's a whole nother story. Um, and just enjoying being a part of this experience is really a journey for us and I'm loving it. Great. It's just great. Great, outstanding. How about the Rotary experience itself? Uh, you've been involved also with uh, quite a few of these trips and travels that you've gone through with Brad. Absolutely, um, the opportunity to travel internationally and do work locally, it changes your life. And for me, one of my key passions is Rotary and the family um, and what it's done for our kids. And they're growing up, um, they got involved very young and before they were 10 years old. And um, going into international areas and helping people and really seeing what Rotary can do and the work of Rotarians all over the world. Sure. It's truly amazing. So I'm in awe of all those folks doing good work everywhere, and I just love being a part of it. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, Brad, what got you into the international part of it? Being a director, you actually serve at the international level, but probably had to come from someplace. Well, it, you know, my father being a tour operator, I started off fairly young. In fact, during the entire time I worked at Clorox, I'd take my vacations to escort tours. So. I started taking tours overseas when I was 19 and have traveled, had the opportunity to travel uh, fairly extensively. And actually, it was the other way around. I mean, I got more involved with Rotary because of its international element. I uh, 
really have appreciated the chance to, it's not so much seeing different sites, that has value to it, but it's really integrating with the culture. And if you go to a place often enough, you start really assimilating part of that culture into that, your perspective on the world. And uh, so as I started traveling and I started taking people overseas to do things um, with our company, we started, well, actually back in the uh, 1990s, 1998, we started taking people over for humanitarian missions overseas through Rotary. And getting more involved with that kind of led me on a path to getting more involved with Rotary that got me here. The board is a fascinating experience because you have people from all over the world. There's six of us that come from North America, so you could call us somewhat common perception, although the people in the South are a remarkably different culture than we might experience out West. Uh, if Robert Hall is listening, he'll know what I'm talking about. But uh, a few months. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. But, Everybody comes from their own perception of what Rotary is, and it's remarkably different across countries, uh, even though we have a common set of values. Uh, but to bring 17 people, or 19 when you put in the president president-elect, to come together on common issues, because that's what a board has to do, is to focus and, and reach agreement, is a fascinating study of both culture, of background, and, and I love it. I think it's a, it's a fascinating time to, to be a part of the organization. Great, well thank you for sharing that. Uh, we know you brought some pictures along with you, so maybe we can jump into some of these pictures. It shows definitely the uh, international background that you've had and experienced. Well, it, it's fascinating. Um, yes, it, it really this story is probably why I got more involved with Rotary. Um, and it started when we started taking people, and the first slide shows you myself overseas putting two drops of the polio vaccine into the mouth of a child. Uh, this time I believe I was in Nigeria. and. Rotary's been on a 30 plus year mission to eradicate polio globally. We started with about 350,000 cases in, in the mid 1980s when we began the campaign. And currently we have six cases for this year um, in only two countries. So we're very close to the eradication. But I started taking groups overseas, whether it be to put the two drops in the mouth of a child or as the next slide will show, um, taking large groups of people overseas to provide wheelchairs to those who lack mobility. Um, in cooperation with an organization called the Wheelchair Foundation. Um, also been a part of a program that's been operating for the past 10 years in Guatemala, which the next slide will show. We take literally just average Rotarians out of the Bay Area um, and actually a broader uh, geographic area with medical professionals and we go down to provide cleft lip and cleft palate surgeries for these children and we'll do in one week about 100 kids. And while you're changing the faces of all these children, the evolution of an individual as they go down as just a regular person just trying to not do the wrong thing or you know, make sure that they can do the right thing, and they see these kids transform and they get to be a part of it. Um, but it was the next slide that really kind of, for me, put the punctuation point on why I was engaged with Rotary. And that is, um, as Marsha referenced, in 2002, we took our children to Africa, to Ghana, so this is a picture of um, our son, Evan, on the left, um, our daughter, Blair, in the middle. Um, she's seven at the time and a very dear friend of ours over there, Robert Atta, um, as part of that experience. And so th these are the pictures of a lot of engagement that Rotary and Rotarians experience. Um, when you can see the faces in the, the next slide of a young girl um, and these radiant kids and you realize you're helping them live a healthy life, it's remarkable. But what led me on a whole different journey were the whole series of pictures I'm going to share with you now. See, it started in 1998 where we took a group of people to, quite literally, it was one of the first times anybody went out into the field to do work like this, where we went out to take a group to give out the two drops of polio. And so we were in Ghana, and you can see a promotional uh, <coughs> program where people are told that the National Immunization Days are coming. And so we helped actually fund these posters and, and megaphones and, and uh, vehicles and all the mobilization devices to get people to come out. The next picture is the group of us that we took over, a troop all wearing white and ready to go solve the problems of the world. <laughs> and as, as we did this, we had an experience that was extraordinary. We got to look into the eyes of a child and normally up to that point we just gave money. We didn't really look into their eyes. This picture, this next picture you can see of what it looks like to look into a child's eyes and to see their, their 
Sometimes they cry, sometimes they laugh. Uh, the little soldiers come walking up to you when you're giving out the two drops. Some throw their mouth open and you can get it in. The other one, it's kind of like, well, kind of like landing a cow. You know, you sort of have to rope them and then give them the two quick drops and release. Um, but we, when we do that, the picture, the next picture, as you can see in a village, a community of kids. When we went in, we immunized not us singularly, but as part of an effort over one weekend, five million children. This is a national immunization wow. day and we attempt to get everybody. And in doing that, we go into the homes of, of these people. This next picture, I'm standing in a courtyard, this is in Ghana, putting these two drops in the mouth of the child. And this is a typical scene that you see. I mean, what's remarkable about it is, not only do you get to address an issue, a vaccination issue, or the next picture where you see this child um, that I'm giving two drops to, but you get to experience the issues that they're living with. Water and sanitation, um, lack of education, uh, basic needs, uh, and you come to realize it on a human term, not looking at it on TV, but in the individual. So what happened next was kind of a remarkable story. In the next picture, you, there's two gentlemen. One's talking to the microphone. He's a Rotarian from uh, a club in Accra, Ghana. And he had this house, this no, house is the wrong word, a little shack that he would go to, a fishing shack. And he was walking with the gentleman who's standing to his left uh, on the right side of the picture. And as they were walking through a field, they were climbing up some rocks. And the gentleman in, in the blue shirt reached out, put his hand on a rock, and was bitten by a snake. Before my friend there, the, the doctor, could do anything to help the man, he, the gentleman pulled out a knife and quite literally cut off the end of his finger where the snake had bitten. Because in order to get any kind of public health care, he was going to have to climb in the public transit that was two, two hours outside of the capital, get into the hospital, and he realized if it was a poisonous snake, he could be dead by that time. So they realized they needed a, a medical facility. In fact, the next picture shows the only type of medical facility they had, which is quite literally the room where children were born in that village. And that stick that you see in the middle of the picture, yes, it's, it's holding up the roof. That was the entire extent of medical care in that village. Well, this local Rotary Club, I, I came to know this, this uh, gentleman in the club that told me he needed my help. If I could help him raise $50,000, well, I'd never raised any money before. <laughs> and 50, the, I tried for a couple of days to give him all the reasons why I'd be happy to donate a thousand, maybe two. But at the end of two days, um, he took me out to this uh, field. And in this field, they were starting to construct block by block a community health clinic. And I asked him, how long will it take before this is done? Because I can give you the money for the stuff that goes inside. And he said, we hope to raise enough money to, ra to fund this over 10 years. And what he was asking me was to help him to expedite it. Well, through a process that we have in Rotary through grants, I was able to raise the money with the help of a lot of clubs and people guiding me through the process. Um, and we were able to deliver the money two years later. Um, we came out to the same field, and the sign that we saw as we drove up was the Cocorbite Community Clinic. What used to be an open field now stood a beautiful clinic. In the next picture you'll see what it looked like and it was just one of these moments where you realized you did something. I mean, you know, you, you see accomplishments in, in, in the home context and you take them for granted, but when you go overseas and say, because of this rare set of circumstance, I got to do that. Um, so I came up and they put us up, you can see the, the, uh, the ribbons that are in the picture in the next picture, they asked me to come up and cut the ribbons, and we did, and we went inside. And the next picture shows you what we saw, where it used to be an open field where people would cut their fingers off. Here was, here were people getting health care. Well, after we got done inspecting the facility, we came back out to the courtyard, and in the next picture, you can see there were drummers drumming. It was quite a ceremony. In fact, the next picture will show you that there's kids marching. The next picture, just shows you a lot of kids. I mean, the whole village <laughs> turned out for this. Um, in the next picture, you'll see that the, the tribal leaders there who gave us the land for this project blessed the land. And then they asked me to come into the center of the square. And they started wrapping me in this robe. In the next picture, you will see me going through a process of what's called being instooled as an African chief. Now, the reason for that term is you can see I'm sitting on something, and that is, in fact, the stool. The gentleman in front of me is going through the process where he's raising me and lowering me by my shoulders. Um, if you look very carefully, you can see a goat at my feet. 
Um, <laughs> but what you really need to note is the gentleman who's behind me. You see, in this process, they never really told me that there'd be a man standing behind me with a sawed-off shotgun and would fire it in the middle of this presentation. <laughs> it was at the moment that that shotgun went off that I was worried for the health of my new robe. Um, but I was instooled, and in this next picture, I remember my thoughts vividly. I thought, how did I ever wind up doing this? I mean, my father literally drugged me into Rotary, and here it was, what was remarkable was the clinic and this whole episode that I went through. Um, and it's led to a lot of other stories. In fact, in the next picture, you can see I come back periodically to this village, and they believe that I have an absolute role in it. Um, they'll greet me and walk me down the street um, under this umbrella, surrounded by the, the village elders. And then I will meet with the tribal chiefs. In the next picture, you can see um, I'm the one in the middle, um, <laughs> just so you're sure you can locate me. But they have done this, and I get it, because through the Rotary Foundation and being involved with Rotary, we help them build a clinic. Um, and they keep me involved in this relationship so that they have a lifeline to improving their village. And you know what? That's completely cool. I think that that's a wonderful expression. Um, but it's the next series of pictures that mean the most. Um, in the next picture, you can see Marsha um, trying to give two drops to a child. <laughs> And apparently you need to practice it. As you can see, the kids standing in queue, they are all making sure they know how to fulfill their role. And this is how it looks. You stand there, and kids line up, and one after the other comes up to you, and you give out those two drops. But the next two pictures are the most remarkable. The next one is of our son, Evan, here at 12 years old, putting these two drops in. And the next picture is our daughter, Blair. In this picture, she's seven, and the child she's giving those two drops to is about four and a half to five, so just a couple years her junior. And if you, you know, if you asked an average seven-year-old what they thought about polio, they wouldn't even have a clue about what it is. But if you asked our daughter, she'd say, cured it. You know, <laughs> she believes she's a part of the solution. They also know what it's like if you don't cure it, um, if you don't address it. In the next couple of pictures, the first one is our daughter Blair standing next to um, a woman that she helped put into a brand new wheelchair who otherwise was down on a little skateboard makeshift item to give her mobility. And the next picture is Evan standing before me. Um, and what I love about this picture is, in that picture is a Rotarian standing in front of me, really a kid, 12 years old, that views that they had a job to do to help someone else. And so now when Evan and Blair in this last picture, you know, when they talk about Africa, they think of the kids that they met, they think of the parents that they met, the people that they know. And uh, this has been the story that really kind of shaped why I wound up getting more involved with Rotary. Outstanding. Well, great tour. Outstanding pictures, too. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And it's good to see that you've been able to have your family actually involved with that. Very few have that opportunity, I would say. Uh, in Rotary, what is it, about 10% actually get to experience the international part of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, outstanding for you. Now, your children, how old are they now? And are they still doing things similar to this? Our son's going to be 26 and oh our gosh. daughter's 21. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, our daughter's quite involved. Um, she spoke at quite a few interesting, our pets, she was at our um, uh, Northwest, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Far West Pets, and she's been speaking there since she was 14. Uh -huh. So, Rotary gave her the opportunity to really enhance that capability and to speak from her heart and the story that she knows and feels strongly about. Um, all of our kids have gained leadership capabilities, um, comfort speaking publicly, um, and being engaged with helping others. Mm -hmm. Throughout their lives, they've really always chosen opportunities to do that. Nice. And um, our son as well, while he hasn't necessarily been as involved on a Rotary event, um, he's very involved in that, and that's where his heart is, so. Oh, heck, he, he actually made a statement. He said if it wasn't <laughs> for his trip to Africa, <coughs> He would have had nothing to write in his college essays. So um, it kind of helped in that regard. But uh, um, I think both of them, uh, clearly when they took this trip, they changed. They really did. Um, okay. They viewed it globally. Uh, far more for Blair. She's now destined, uh, she's a junior at UCLA, and you can tell she's absolutely destined to doing something in the world. Um, she's done youth exchange. She just uh, finished a semester abroad. 
um, she has been affected in that regard. And as Marcia said, she's had a chance for public speaking. I mean, this past January, she was at a Rotary event in San Diego where she spoke in front of 1,500 people. And that was remarkable, but what was even more remarkable is when I asked her if she wanted to do it, she was like, sure. <laughs> Well, and she's also really involved with activities at UCLA that are related to fundraising and helping those less fortunate or need help. And uh, that's stuff she's done on her own. Wow. She's just proactively, it's part of her. Great. That's Changed their DNA. <laughs> that has. Well, maybe not. Maybe it was always there. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> uh, Brad, tell us a little bit, of, um, give us a little view of what's behind the curtain of uh, Rotary International as far as being a director. What, what does that job entail? Share a little bit about us, the experience that you're having right now as a director. Well, it's fascinating. I mean, you, you, it's as much as you can make out of it. Um, first of all, you have a lot of opportunity to connect with the local Rotary Clubs, and particularly through the district leadership, because that's who you're really, that's my job, is to support them first and foremost, to try and help them um, with resources and with their needs. Uh, but many opportunities to speak to clubs and get to know the spectrum of what's going on. But when you do this, when you're in the field, what's really necessary is to be able to observe what's going on and understand it on a broader scale as to how it affects what should Rotary be doing in order to be of service to its clubs so that they can be stronger. And if they're stronger, they have the ability to do a lot in their communities. So one part is in the field, and that involves much of it public speaking, but engagement with, with them helping them to achieve what they need to, what the clubs need to. Then the second piece of that is working in with Evanston staff. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, discussion right now. Rotary in its evolution, I mean, we're at 100, 111 years of existence. We're really at a transformative place in our, in our organization from the traditional role of what Rotary has been into the need to change and adapt to today's social and societal environment. I mean, it used to be that coming to a weekly meeting to meet with your friends over a meal, share that experience and help other people was essential. Now, for most people there in the workforce, the only meal that they have away from their desk at lunch is their rotary meeting. Uh, most would prefer to stay at their desk and get things done because that's the, the way we are. You don't have to write a check anymore to volunteer your time to help other people. You can just show up at, with an organization. Uh, further to that, because life is so busy, volunteering for, to help other people gets dealt with in a whole different way than we used to when we grew up. So right now we're at a point where there's a lot of discussion of how to transform Rotary into becoming more relevant for the next wave. More than 50%, 52% of the population on Earth is 30 years and younger. So there's a lot of conversation is what is Rotary gonna look like when that group turns into mainstream? How is it going to be relevant to who they are? So right now, that's a lot working with our strategic planning group and with our, our membership group to try and figure out a path to help clubs to get there. Very good. Um, that At the level of director and working at it internationally, how different is it from culture to culture, from country to country, where you're representing different groups and organizations but trying to create the same goals and objectives? Well, it, it's... Tremendous. I mean, because the way you reach decisions is, is quite a bit different. I mean, for example, the Japanese culture, they will defer quite a bit. So you have to really engage them and give them license to say something. And that's a culture that doesn't necessarily like to, to say something negative about it. So if you're in debate and they have an opposing viewpoint, you really have to work with them to hear, to, to hear what's going on because there's a lot of rotary in Japan and in that part of the world. Um, in Africa, there's a different protocol to engagement. So. Part of the job of this is to try and figure out how the different cultures reach a decision so that you can engage them uh, properly. The Americans tend to be more drivers towards, you know, get me to the end quickly. And so if we go along that path, then you're not fully using the resources of your entire board. Um, and then part of it is when you go to their turf, because while I have regional responsibility here, corporately I have responsibility making decisions that affect the world, as everybody else does on the board you've got to understand the audience globally. And so you go overseas and, and observe through trips to Africa. I've done a lot in Central America and Asia. You kind of get a sense as to how to do it. That's helped me quite a bit. It takes a lot for the members of the board to figure that part out um, as to how to do it. 
But the good news is when, when you come together as this board, we've been together for now about a year and a half, right. and you really kind of get a sense of friendship first, and you yeah. work that through, and that allows you to be more candid of expression of decisions. And uh, In fact, there's a great article, if you look in the April edition of the Rotarian Magazine, it literally just came out. There is an article with cool. pictures of what is it like at the board. What Ravi Ravindran, our president, wanted to do is to make it transparent. So we invited in photographers and a uh, person to come and write the story of what happens at a board meeting. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What do we say? It just came out. Uh, I just got it in my office yesterday. It was a great read, and hopefully mm. Rotarians will find it the same. Sounds good. Language and the language barriers. How is that addressed yeah. at the board level? Well, I it's interesting. There's two things. First, we do simultaneous translation, uh, simultaneous interpretation. So when anybody speaks at the board, you have to be recognized. You have to press a microphone. And that's not to be amplified within the boardroom. It is, in fact, so that the, the translators who are all in the back, simultaneous interpretation, uh, people that are in, the, in their booths, can hear what you're saying and quite literally do it simultaneously. It's a fascinating individual that can both listen and speak at the same time. So on our board this year, we have a person who speaks Italian. We have a person who speaks Portuguese. We have a person who speaks Japanese. So we have we always carry these interpreters when we're doing this whenever we travel. Um, there are six official languages in Rotary, so this is just three of six that happen to be here. Um, we don't have needs for those other languages. But beyond that, we have a number of people on the board who English is their second language. So while they converse in English, they don't converse in the same way I do. They don't think as fast as we do in, in English. So you really have to slow down the decision process and not just speak more slowly, but give a chance for everybody to digest what is being said and then play it back. Um, so that's how we handle the, the differences in language. Good, good. Um, lastly, zone. Tell us a little bit about the zone actually that you're representing, the two different zones in the regional area. Yeah. So. Let me, let me describe it just to make sure everybody has an understanding of what the zone means, because for most, that's a transparent sure. and necessarily transparent entity. The essence of Rotary is a club, and we aggregate clubs together in geographic regions behind a district. So most r clubs are familiar with the district governor, the official that, that, if you will, administers that district. These districts come together under a larger administrative process, and those are known as zones. Globally, there are 34 zones worldwide and every director is responsible for two. So that in and of itself tells you there's 17 members of the board because each of us represent two zones. Uh, so there's 17 members of the board, then there's two additional people, Ravi Ravindran, our president, and John Germ, our president-elect. So my geography is uh, over zones 25 and 26. Zone 25 starts up uh, British Columbia, Victoria, Vancouver Island, um, a significant part of Washington, a little bit of Idaho, all of Oregon, Northern California and Northern Nevada. And then Zone 26, the second part of that, starts right at the same point. It's contiguous to Zone 25, gets all the rest of California, all the rest of Nevada, Arizona, and Hawaii. Right. About um, uh, 1,300 Rotary Clubs, 23 districts, and 60,000 Rotarians. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's been 10 years since we met. The first time we met, we sat together as voting delegates in Copenhagen. First time we shook hands. It's been a while. And uh, I have to tell Bruce, uh, he could decide on who did the best job on the show. You mean, you mean cousin, cousin Bruce, Bruce. Howard, yes, yeah. from the Cambria Club. Yeah. Just can I say here, take a little bit of a liberty, that there's always been a debate. We've always said in the family, I'm the handsome Howard, and he's the elder Howard. <laughs> we are going to cut at that one. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much for your time, very much for being here. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. We will see you next time.